coming in at number 10, we have SCP-1591. So SCP-1591 is a big, beautiful, levitating glass star sculpture. It seems that at the core of the sculpture, there is glass in the shape of a star weighing around 12 kilos. This in turn is surrounded by further coloured glass panels weighing 12 kilos each. It's a heavy enough star. Here's a picture for those of you struggling to visualise, and really a picture is all you want here because you actually couldn't look at this SCP directly. It seems that SCP-1591 is kept in a room with 30 high intensity spotlights pointed right at it. These spotlights need to be replaced monthly. Why? Well, SCP-151 produces a light of its own, which increases in brightness and intensity over time, especially in dark environments. When its light shines on a solid object, it at first becomes transparent and then slowly fades away, hence why the spotlight needs replacing as they slowly break down and stop working. Now, If a person is directly exposed to the light, they will lose the ability to speak and will try and run away. Unfortunately though, the light will destroy them, eventually making them disappear. It seems that SCP-1591's power was increased when the site was bombed in the World War. It seems that as time goes on, the brightness of the lights used to quell 1591 needs to increase. For example, if a 40 watt bulb contained it a week ago, by now it will need a 60 watt, so on and so forth. Each month when the spotlights are replaced, they have to get brighter. Now this SCP can only be stopped by bright lights, but eventually we'll run out of lights bright enough. When we do, it will start evaporating things on Earth, everything around it. I guess our only option is to like take it to the sun. Okay, I'm a drama girl, so I will absolutely bite. I love the concept behind SCP-701, but it's deadly. Information coming here at number 9. SCP-701 is a five act play named The Hanged King's Tragedy. There are multiple copies of the play on lockdown in an anonymous storage site in the SCP Foundation. The observed behaviour surrounding SCP-701 is as follows. A group of people decide to do a play, The Hanged King's Tragedy, and as they start rehearsing it, they notice that the content changes every Every time they meet up, but they don't really realise it, just something weird's going on. As the play begins for its opening night, it's a sellout, a mysterious figure, SCP-701-1, appears on the stage at the end of Act 1. Now The figure is a tall humanoid dressed in black with a hood over its head. The audience noticed, but the cast do not. The audience obviously think it's part of the play, and they're enjoying it. He then continues to appear at intervals before officially coming on stage as the Hanged King during Act 5. Under his gaze, the cast then begin to kill themselves on stage until they're all dead. This is when the audience realise that actually, this is no play. Riots break out in the audience, and if any audience member manages to leave, they do so in a daze, committing random acts of violence until they're killed or intercepted by members of the SCP Foundation. If audience members survive and are treated, they're often psychotic for the rest of their life. Some may have no memory of the incident. The reason the reason this SCP could end the world lays in the fact that a VHS and DVD of the performance exists. Anyone who watches it would be prone to hateful and violent outbursts. One play that I don't think I'd enjoy. Coming into number 8, we have SCP-173. Ah, the sculpture. This SCP is all of your weeping angel nightmares come true. Although we all do have to enjoy the rhyme of saying SCP-173. Absolutely none of us wants to be around this super creep though, I'm telling you. SCP-173 is on lockdown in a sealed container in Unit 19 of the SCP Foundation. The SCP itself has been known as the art piece, as it looks like some kind of ghoulish contemporary art sculpture from hell. Before we talk about the main concern with the SCP, I'd just like to highlight that it seems to seep feces and blood, which is pretty damn unsanitary. Aside from that though, like with the weeping angels in Doctor Who, you basically never ever ever want to close your eyes around it. Why? Because if you do, it will come closer and closer to you, and when it does finally get to you, it will snap your neck at the base of your skull. It's a killer, so no blinking. The SCP-173 will not stop until everyone who has ever blinked in its presence is dead. So next up, we kind of basically have the exact opposite of SCP-173 at number 7. We have SCP-096. So I'm not going to show you a picture of SCP-096. SCP-096. Instead, you can look at me. You'll find out why. Often referred to as the shy guy, SCP-096 will get you. I guess they all get you in the end, don't they? SCP-096 is kept in a lock steel cube and is checked 
up weekly for cracks and holes. There can be absolutely no CCTV or video surveillance of any kind when it comes to SCP-096. Any images of this SCP must be destroyed. You can't even draw it. Why? SCP-096 is a humanoid looking creature with long limbs. It has blank pale eyes and its jaw can open four times wider than that of a normal human. Unlike with SCP-173, you can't look at it ever. If you do look at it, it will freak out and kill you. Exactly how it kills you is classified. SCP-096 is noted for freaking out, crying, screaming and becoming crazed when people look at it. Similarly, if a picture or a recording is taken, it will go crazy and kill. It seems that even looking at a photo or video if this SCP can kill you too. Exactly how? Once again, I don't know. How could it destroy the world? Well, if enough people saw it, hello, dead. Coming into number six, we have SCP-1048. Okay, but like an SCP that looks like a teddy bear. I mean, that absolutely can't be good news, can it? And no, it isn't. SCP-1048 at first seems like a lovable teddy. Cute. It can move of its own accord, communicate through cutesy gestures, and loves hugs. Or so it seems. But it is all a ruse. SCP-1048 will often hug people's legs and draw childlike pictures and give them as gifts. It will even dance and jump, anything to make someone like it. But make no mistake, a lot like people who try hard in life, SCP-1048 is pure evil. Something the SCP Foundation discovered the hard way. On one occasion, the SCP was observed having entire replicated itself out of metal scraps. It seems that SCP-1048 has the ability to replicate using any given material, and for this reason, no teddy bears are allowed in the SCP Foundation whatsoever. Prior to the ear incident, this SCP was free to roam its holding site, but following the nightmare, the Foundation realised its true intentions. Oh, what was the ear incident? Let me tell you. It seems that SCP-1048 replicated itself out of human ears, removing the ears of all of the people around it within a 10 meter radius. A teddy bear made of ears. On one occasion, it appears that the SCP was able to abort a pregnant staff member's baby as it began replicating itself with baby parts. Honestly, a world filled with SCP teddy bears that pretend to be cuddly but then use deception and murder in order to replicate, honestly, it sounds like a dangerous world to me. Coming into number 5, we have SCP-1471. SCP-1471 will wreak havoc with your mobile devices. It's a free app, usually named Mallow or version 1. 1.00 in app stores. Now there's no listed developer, and somehow it's able to bypass approval. Once the app has been downloaded, users won't see any icon or shortcut and they will not be able to delete it. They're doomed. The SCP will then begin sending images to the phone every three to six hours. The image will contain SCP-1471-A, a humanoid with a goat-like skull with black hair. In the first 24 hours, the images will show the figure at locations frequented by the individual who downloaded the app. In the following 24 hours, the SCP will shop at places recently visited by the individual. After 72 hours, the individual will receive real time images of SCP 1471A within close proximity to them. Those who have had the app for 90 hours or more will begin to visualize SCP 1471A within their peripheral vision or even their reflections or both. From then on in, it's a downward spiral. Individuals will actually see the SCP who will try and communicate with them in a language that they don't understand. So, how could this end the world? Well, almost everyone has a phone, and this SCP will send people mad thinking they're seeing a skull with hair and crazy eyes. While this SCP has never been reported to have killed anyone, with people losing their minds around it, it would be hazardous to mental health and productivity. People wouldn't get any work done in a best case scenario. In a worst case, they would cause accidents or perhaps even try and gouge out their own eyes, which, again, infections. Nightmare. Puss. This SCP will send you insane at number four. We have SCP-055. This SCP is literally unknowable. It's unknowable by definition. Whatever it is, it makes humans forget about it. Information about it just leaks out of humans' brains. It's a self-keeping secret. It is placed at Site-19, although how the facility was built, we don't actually know. All we know is that Site-19 is 5 by 5.2.5 in meters. What am I going to do with this information? Like nothing. 
nothing. We don't know what's in this space and those who go on to investigate it forget. Research has been conducted on those who have been exposed to the SCP and it seems that the only way of knowing it is by a series of yes no answers. Now the loophole here is that while you can't know what it is or say what it is, you can know what it isn't. It seems one person question was asked if it was a sphere to which they said no, but afterwards they didn't know what they were being asked so not a sphere. Good. Great. What is it? Well, we don't no. To me, this makes me worried because it means we have no idea what it's up to. It could absolutely be plotting to end the world and knowing the SCP Foundation, it like probably is. Shall we start with a picture at number 3 to get the ball rolling? Sure, here it is. This is SCP-610 and it's an infection that causes serious and grotesque mutation. It pit hurrah and we're back to pus again. Exposure to SCP-610 at first leads individuals to develop an itchy rash along with skin sensitivity. The rash will turn into heavy lesions and areas of what look like fresh scar tissue. These scar tissue wounds will then consume the whole body and the process gets even quicker in warm conditions. It can take anywhere from 5 minutes in hot conditions to 5 hours in cold conditions and it can absolutely destroy a person. The infected then no longer resembles a person and starts functioning at very high speed. The infected skin will start to grow rapidly and move of its own accord with limbs becoming long and then branching out like roots forming other fleshy limbs. Look. Without containment, they will continue to grow and any living organism who touches it will become infected too. Un. Infection is spread by touch and sometimes even spores in the air. The infection was first noted in Siberia and while it has been contained, it hasn't been destroyed. The areas infected continue to be so and they are protected by SCP under the guise of military operations. If the containment was breached, then this infection could absolutely destroy the world. World. Coming into number 2 we have SCP-1548. Well to me, this really is the baddie to end all baddies, except our number 1 of course. SCP-1548 is cosmic and it wants us dead. SCP-1548 is a living star, an evil solar system moving towards us at breakneck speed. It seems this SCP was first discovered in the 1970s with astronomers thinking it was simply another star, until it started moving towards us at increasing speed. Oh, and it's speaking to us via radio signals. It's a sentient star. Hurrah! So? What's it saying? That it wants to destroy all life in its path and it finds us pathetic. Good. Oh, and it also knows we're watching it too. How will it destroy us? Well, it seems it will steal us from our sun's orbit and then gobble us up in its fiery mouth. How long until it reaches us? Well, that's classified. Finally, coming into number one when you thought it couldn't get any worse. It does. It's the Scarlet King. Ah, the original SCP or the original evil. The Scarlet King was originally named as SCP-001 until the SCP Foundation realised that actually he cannot be categorised as he is malice itself. Let me explain. It seems that the Scarlet King is a creature, to quote Jack Finch, whose sole demonic occupation is to usher in Armageddon and the end of all creation. Sure. The Scarlet King is the most malevolent entity in the universe and was born alongside the Tree of Knowledge, or so they say. The Scarlet King is as old as knowledge itself, and it seems that he's the overlord of darkness itself too. So basically, he's the devil. The actual devil. It's said that the Scarlet King is an elder god who has the power to conquer and destroy entire worlds, let alone civilizations. What's his beef? Well, he's declared war on creation itself, so not great. The SCP Foundation seems to think that any manifestation of evil is at the bidding of the Scarlet King. So a god as old as understanding who's made it his sole purpose to end creation? I mean, it doesn't sound like a party I want to be at, does it? If you want to know about this SCP, we've got a video all about it on Life's Biggest Questions, basically the home of like all kinds of SCP content. Starting off this countdown, we have Henry Smolinski. Henry Smolinski was the inventor of the flying car. Yeah, you heard me correctly. Well, at least he tried to create a flying car. But he's on this list, so as you know, it didn't quite work out for him. So Henry, along with his partner Hal Blake, created this by pairing together a car and a plane. He took the wings of an aircraft and configured it onto a car. As you can imagine, they had quite a difficult time with this. During the first test, they experienced engine failures. In 1973, they encountered trouble with the plane wings. On September 11th, 1973, Henry and Hal were taking their invention for a spin 
When the wings detached from the vehicle during a test flight, the car crashed down into a pickup truck and burst into flames. Apparently a bad welding job was responsible for this. Sadly, the two inventors lost their lives. Coming in at number nine, we have Thomas Midgley Jr. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up because it really helps me out. So he was an American engineer and chemist. Sadly, when he was 51 years old, he contracted polio, but that didn't stop him from inventing. In fact, he created a system to help others lift him out of bed. He did this with a complex system of strings and pulleys, but in 1944, he became trapped in the ropes and was strangled to death by them. He passed away at the hand of his invention. In our eighth spot, we have William Bullock. William Bullock was an American inventor who created the rotary printing press in 1863. This invention helped revolutionize the printing industry greatly. The press could print up to 12,000 sheets an hour and later it could print as many as 30,000 sheets an hour. Sadly, William passed away while trying to repair it. His foot ended up getting crushed under the machine after trying to kick a pulley into place. He survived the incident, but later his foot developed gangrene after getting infected. He passed away while getting his foot amputated. Coming in at number seven, we have Henry Winstanley. Henry Winstanley was the inventor of the first Eddie Stone lighthouse. The lighthouse was eight feet high and 24 feet in diameter. His other designs failed, but he had high hopes with this one. In fact, he wished, and I quote, to be in the lighthouse during the greatest storm that ever was. And well, his wish did come true. On November 14th, 1698, the lighthouse became operational. Here's the thing. Over the years, the lighthouse began to deteriorate. One night, there was a huge storm warning and Henry would get his wish to be in the lighthouse during a storm. But the lighthouse was no match for the powerful storm. That night, the lighthouse collapsed, taking the lives of Henry and five other men. Moving on to number six, we have Marie Curie, a great chemist who won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1903. Curie is known for a number of things. She discovered the elements radium and polonium. Due to her work and research, she is credited with inventing radiography or x-rays. Sadly for her work, she was often exposed to radiation. This was before they knew the dangerous effects that ionizing radiation has on the body. She would often do her experiments in a shed with no safety measures. And apparently she used to carry around test tubes containing radioactive isotopes in her pocket. She even kept them in her desk drawer. So yeah, that's not safe. In July of 1934, she passed away from a plastic anemia as a result of her exposure to radiation. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Alexander Bogdanov. Alexander can be thanked for the invention of blood transfusions. That has saved countless lives. But he started doing blood transfusions to see if there were any rejuvenating effects. All throughout the 1920s, he was running experiments on this to try and achieve eternal youth. He had 11 blood transfusions and was adamant that it was helping him. He claimed it improved his eyesight and stopped his balding. Sadly, on his 12th transfusion, something went wrong. He exchanged a liter of blood with a physics student but they had traces of tuberculosis and malaria in the blood. After the transfusion, his body began shutting down. On April 7th, 1928, his heart failed and he passed away. In our fourth spot, we have Sylvester H. Roper. Sylvester was responsible for inventing the world's first motorcycle. How it worked was it was basically a bicycle with a steam engine attached. For 13 years, he used his invention. It was cool, but it didn't go very fast. In 1896 though, he got it to go up to 40 miles per hour. On June 1st, 1896, Sylvester took his invention out for a ride to show off his new speed. However, while on the ride, he actually suffered from a heart attack, or so they believe. He wiped out and then passed away. To the witnesses around, they say the vehicle went off course and then crashed into the sand. But according to the autopsy, he had a heart attack, lost control, and then crashed. In our third spot, we have Horace Lawson Hunley. Horace Lawson Hunley invented the submarine, but it was never as successful as he wanted. His first design ended up trapping seven sailors underwater. They all sadly passed away. So he went back to working on it to make it bigger and better. 
but his second model was a fail again. The submarine sank in Mobile Bay, Alabama. But that didn't get him down. He made another model. Sadly, this model took his life. On October 15, 1863, Hunley decided to go on board of the submarine while running another test. Sadly, it sunk again, and Hunley, along with some crew members, were trapped underwater. Some did manage to survive, but Hunley did not. In our second spot, we have Valerian Abakovsky. He is responsible for inventing the Aero Wagon, which was a propeller-driven rail car. His goal was to use it to transport officials quickly across the Soviet Union. The car had an aircraft engine attached to it and propeller traction. It could go up to 87 miles per hour. On July 24th, 1921, Valerian, along with some other men, decided to take the vehicle from Moscow to Tula to test it out. They successfully reached their destination. However, they never made it back. On the way home, the aero wagon derailed and seven out of the 22 men on board passed away, including Valerian. And in our number one spot, we have Franz Rieschelt. On February 4th, 1912, inventor Franz climbed to the top of the Eiffel Tower. His plan was to jump off and use the suit he made to fly down to the ground. The suit he wore was a wearable parachute and resembled just a big cloak. At first, he said he would test the suit out with a dummy. But that day, for some reason, he said he was going to make the jump himself. Although past attempts with the dummy failed, he was still determined to try his invention out himself. Around 8.22 that morning, he was on top of the Eiffel Tower. He stood there proud and then stepped off the ledge. Sadly, the parachute folded around his body immediately and he plummeted down to the ground. He left a 5.9 inch crater in the ground. And as you can imagine, his injuries were gruesome. But apparently, an autopsy revealed that he passed away from a heart attack during his fall. So when he hit the ground, he was already dead. All right, starting off this countdown, we have Otto Lilienthal. Otto Lilienthal was referred to as the Glider King. Why? Because he invented the hang glider. In fact, over the years, he constructed 18 types of gliders and took over 2,000 glider flights. However, on August 9th, 1896, that was the last flight he would ever take. So he was on his glider when he lost control and the glider went straight into a nosedive. He fell 17 meters down and broke his spine. While on his way down, he yelled, sacrifices must be made. Sadly, he passed away the next day in the hospital. Otto's invention though had a huge impact on the aviation industry, so he would be proud. Moving on to number nine, we have Francis Edgar Stanley. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Also check out part one if you haven't already. In 1897, Francis Edgar Stanley and his brother began developing steam powered cars and they created their own company, the Stanley Motor Company. From 1902 to 1909, they used their cars in races to prove its efficiency. In fact, they often would place better than gas-powered cars. In 1906, the two built a steam car that won a record for traveling the fastest mile, which was 28.2 seconds, which means it traveled at 127 miles per hour. Sadly, in July of 1918, Francis passed away while driving his car. He's not sure how fast he was driving, but he swerved off the road to avoid hitting some horse-pulled farm wagons and ended up crashing into a pile of logs. The crash took his life. Also, if you guys hear banging, it's because we're getting construction done and it's really distracting and yeah. Moving on to number eight, we have Max Valier. Max Valier is best known for his invention of the rocket car. In 1928, he created these rocket cars that could travel up to 145 miles per hour. He invented this because of his desire of traveling between Berlin and New York City in just one hour. A year later, he created a rocket powered sled that hit 250 miles per hour. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to go faster. His end goal was to actually help with space flight. Sadly, he never got to. In 1930, Max started to experiment with rockets using liquid propellant, but it all went wrong when one of his rockets accidentally exploded. Sadly, he passed away in this explosion. In our seventh spot, we have Wan Hu. Wan Hu was a 16th century Chinese local government official. Believe it or not, he wanted to become an astronaut before the word was even coined. Basically, this guy invented a makeshift rocket ship that he thought would propel him to the moon. He tied 47 rockets to a large wicker chair. Don't come at me, apparently they had form of rockets back then, okay? Anyways, 
Then he had 47 assistants, each light one fuse. There was a lot of smoke, a huge bang, and then when the smoke cleared, Hugh and the chair were gone. Sadly, it didn't work out for him the way that he hoped. Coming in at number six, we have Louis Jimenez. Louis Jimenez was an American artist best known for his huge fiberglass sculptures. In 2006, Louis was working on a 32 foot high blue Mustang sculpture. It was going to be for a Denver International Airport. Sadly, he would never go on to finish his masterpiece. On June 13th, while working on it, a section of the sculpture fell on his leg and severed an artery. He sadly passed away. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Thomas Andrews. Thomas Andrews was a shipbuilder. What ship did he design and build, you may ask? None other than the Titanic. Yep. In fact, he suggested that the Titanic should have more lifeboats. He said there should be at least 46, but no one listened to him and only 20 were added. Anyways, Thomas was aboard the Titanic when it struck the iceberg. He spent the last hours of his life helping people find life jackets and escorting them onto lifeboats. After he felt like his mission was complete, apparently he went into the first class smoking room and just stared at a painting as the ship went down. Sadly, his body was never recovered, but he went down as a hero. Coming in at number four, we have Louis Slotin. Louis Slotin is said to be one of the brightest minds of his generation. At one point in his life, he went to London to get his doctorate in chemistry. And then he was actually recruited to work as part of a top secret team to develop the atomic bomb. He was mainly working with uranium and plutonium and other very dangerous chemicals. Sadly, in May of 1946, his hand slipped and he accidentally sent off a fission reaction. This released a burst of radiation hitting him directly. In one version of the story, he actually threw himself over the radioactive materials to protect his colleagues from this blast. He died less than two weeks after his exposure. I think that's incredible though, if he really did sacrifice his life to protect his colleagues. Like, what a man. Hit that thumbs up button if you agree. Moving on to number three, we have James Douglas. And it's weird because I have a friend named James Douglas Ho, but you know, it's not the same person, clearly. I mean, unless he's a time traveler, who knows? James Douglas was the fourth Earl of Morton. In 1564 in Edinburgh, inventors were asked to submit their ideas for an invention that could kill people in a clean manner. James ended up inventing a guillotine type device that could slice a person's head off in one stroke. Well, guess what? In 1580, he was arrested and charged with being an accessory to murder. He then was sent for execution. And what device did they use to do this? None other than the killing machine that he invented. So he quite literally lost his head to his invention. Coming in at number two, we have Karel Sausick. This guy was a crazy Canadian stuntman that wanted to do the biggest and most daring stunts out there. One of the stunts he did involved plunging over the Niagara Falls in a barrel that he designed. The barrel was padded and designed so that he would be protected from the jagged rocks at the bottom of the falls. In 1984, he went over the falls and survived. He was injured, but he still managed to complete the stunt. On January 19th, 1985, Carell decided to partake in another stunt. This one, however, would be his last. So for the stunt, so for the stunt, he invented a shock-proof padded barrel. His goal was then to be dropped. In, his goal was then to be in the barrel and drop from 180 feet and plunge down into a water tank below. Sadly, on his way down, the barrel missed the tank, it hit the rim of the tank, and he was cut from the barrel. He passed away shortly after. And in our number one spot today, we have Li Si. Li Si was a chancellor from the Qin Dynasty during the third century BC. Well, he invented something called the Five Pains or the Five Punishments. And it was a very brutal torture method. Basically, the victim would be subjected to four very painful and gruesome punishments. After the fourth one, the victim would be executed. So first, their forehead was branded. Then their nose was sliced off, then their feet, then their private area, and then finally they were executed. By that time, the victims were in so much pain that they wanted to be put out of their misery. Now, here's the thing. In 208 BC, Li Si was arrested and charged with conspiring to prevent Fu Shu from becoming the next emperor. He was then sentenced to die by his own invention. Yeah, I bet he wished he never came up with that in the first place. 
Ouch. I guess that's what they mean by what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm.